This is episode 87 of the Psychcast by MD Edge, where we bring you interviews with leaders in the fields of psychiatry and psychology, masterclass lectures, and relevant inspiration straight to your ears. New episodes of the Psychcast drop on Wednesdays. I'm the voice of MD Edge Podcasts, Nick Andrews. Coming up later, the MDH Psychiatry Editor-in-Chief, Dr. Lorenzo Norris, welcomes Dr. Mark Gold to talk about opioids and suicide. But before we get to this week in psychiatry, I wanted to mention something that we're doing at MDH Podcasts in an effort to improve the Psychcast and all of our shows. We have a simple listener survey available for any of you who want to leave some feedback on the show. The goal of the survey is to learn a little bit more about you uh, to improve the interviews, lectures, timing of production, and, and really anything that we can improve upon uh, for the show for your for your benefit. I know there's a ton of things you have to do in the day, but if you like the show, if you have any thoughts on how it can be improved, please take a few moments and answer the questions in the survey. A link to the survey is available in the show notes. Okay, it's time for This Week in Psychiatry. This week in psychiatry, a story on how patient behavior impacts the emotional health of physicians. Despite an increasingly diverse workforce, a new study has found that many patients remain biased towards certain types of physicians, which can produce substantial negative effects, but also some positive effects. This is according to new research published in JAMA Internal Medicine. In the study, researchers led 13 focus groups that were attended by 11 internal medicine hospitalist physicians, 26 internal medicine residents, and 13 medical students who were all affiliated with the University of California San Francisco School of Medicine. The researcher's aim was to determine the perspectives of physicians and trainees in regard to patient bias, along with potential barriers to responding to that bias effectively. Participants recalled remarks that ranged from refusal of care and questioning the physician's role to ethnic jokes and questions about ethnic background as well as inappropriate flirtations or compliments. The effects of these behaviors on the physician participants included negative responses, like carrying an emotional burden and withdrawing from work, as well as some positive responses, like an increased desire for self-growth and the desire to pursue career leadership opportunities. Barriers to addressing these behaviors included a lack of support, uncertainty about the appropriate response to the patient, and being perceived as unprofessional. Deciding how to respond or whether to respond at all was often dictated by the level of support from the participants' colleagues, a professional responsibility to peers, and the presence of a positive role model who would have made the same choice as they did. And that's it for this week in psychiatry. Don't forget you can read stories like this each and every day at mdh.com slash psychiatry. We'll be right back with this week's interview on opioids and suicide. Welcome back to the Sidecast by MD Edge. I am Nick Andrews. It's time now for the interview portion of this week's episode. Please welcome Editor-in-Chief of MD Edge Psychiatry, Dr. Lorenzo Norris, and Dr. Mark Gold. I'm Dr. Mark Gold. I was a professor, distinguished professor and chairman at the University of Florida College of Medicine in Gainesville, Florida. And over the last five years, have been an adjunct professor at Washington University in St. Louis. I started my career in the early 1970s in addiction psychiatry and in translational neuroscience at uh, Yale working with um, Herb Kleber and opioid use disorders and George Agigeni and Bob Bick and translating animal models to humans. So I've worked in tobacco, alcohol, opioids, cocaine, and methamphetamine research um, for my entire career. I have over a thousand peer-reviewed scientific publications, and you can find some of them on my own uh, website or follow my blog. This is Dr. Lorenzo Norris, Editor-in-Chief of MDH Psychiatry. We are pleased to have with us today uh, Dr. Mark Gold, who is going to be joining us on the Psychcast today and talking to us about some really relevant topics uh, around opiate use disorders and suicides. Dr. Gold, I want to thank, uh, w- welcome you to the Psychcast. Well, thanks for inviting me. It's my pleasure. Very good. So, Dr. Gold, um, one of the things in terms of 
suicide and opiates. And I guess I'm just going to start with the idea of overdoses. Now, early on in medical school and training, we all learn about overdoses at, as a common method that whether intentional or accidental in which um, patients can take their life. Um, I was wondering if you could give us a bit more, if you will, thoughts or overview of what we currently understand about um, the with what we understand about overdoses and really their relation to um, suicide. Well, good. So let's let's start with uh, the number of overdoses. There, there's been a great alarm because the number of overdoses has gone up and up, and actually life expectancy has started to go down in the United States, almost as if we're a third world country as a result of drug overdoses. Over 70,000 drug overdoses occurred in 2017. And that's a large increase, almost a 10% increase year after year from 2016. Opioids like heroin or fentanyl, other than methadone, are considered as the main cause of these drug overdose deaths. So if you think about drug overdose deaths and say, well, there's 70,000 in total, there's about 50,000 drug overdose deaths that um, opioids are directly involved in. And right now the CDC would say at least 192 drug overdose deaths occur every day. So some people in the, uh, who are practicing in different parts of the United States would see more of this, and some people would see less. So West Virginia would see the, the greatest amount of these drug overdose deaths, but not uh, but followed closely by, like, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and District of Columbia, where uh, I think you're calling me from, and Kentucky. So even though we were in Florida, and Florida is a state that isn't ordinarily mentioned or uh, as, a, as a top overdose state, there are significant increases year after year in Florida, Georgia, Alabama, Arizona, California, Michigan, New Jersey, New York, and a large number of states you can find your own state on the CDC's map. So first and foremost, we have an overdose epidemic, mostly made up of opioids, but we can talk a little bit about the reemergence of cocaine and methamphetamine as major causes of the remainder of the overdose deaths. But we started thinking, <clears throat> like, what do people believe about overdose deaths? And the CDC and um, the coroner's reports list these deaths as accidental. And so I just raised the question with um, one of the editors of MD Edge. I said, how do we know they're accidental? And when you actually interrogate the data, the individual coroner data, the, the autopsy reports, the, uh, there's just so many deaths that they've almost automatically until very recently, been considered accidental. Well, that's, again, just this idea that until very recently these overdose deaths were considered accidental. Um, when when you describe this data, the overdose epidemic, uh, with opiates being a large component of it, and I also think back to your work in the field starting in the 70s and just the changes that we've seen, but when we take the data, when we take the the if you will, where we are at with the numbers, what I actually think about um, is something that um, a patient told me, particularly who was dealing with a substance use disorder, and that he considered the substance use disorder is just another slow, it's just actually, if I can remember to quote correctly, it was just a slow form of suicide. It was just mm -hmm. a slow form of suicide. And that actually stuck with me. I remember that when I was a resident and the patient told me that. And it was one of those moments that just stood in my head. So although people 
up, up until probably recently, we would go back and, okay, well, this person overdosed or they used too much or they got, if you will, a hot shot, if, the, if I'm using right. the jargon correctly. Um, but when that patient said that to me, I said, wait a minute, hold it. On some level, many of our patients know that this is, to continue this, is just a slow, inevitable march towards suicide, whether or not it is immediately overt or if you just basically get yourself up to that point. So with that being said, can you tell us a little bit more about this idea or this hypothesis that we've had probably for decades in terms of um, overdoses being accidental? You know, I, I think if you look at the overdose literature, overdoses are first considered accidental unless there's a suicide note. Um, or the person um, in so, some other way expressed uh, the intent to die. It, but there's really, you can't interview somebody who's overdosed, but you can interview somebody who's been um, given Narcan or Naloxone and mm -hmm. rescued. And so we've been, you know, I mean, I, I think your your point of view is the point of view that I had, which is chronic opioid self-administration changes the brain and in the chronic use scenario the person gets less and less high and gets more and more depressed over time the number uh, one psychotropic medication class used in methadone programs are antidepressants and that's logical because depression and anhedonia come along with chronic use drugs of abuse target the brain's reinforcement and mood centers destabilize those and make depression more likely. But psychiatrists have been largely absent from the overdose crisis. So if you think about it, a person overdoses on opioids, they might be given naloxone by an EMT or get to a hospital emergency department, be given naloxone, and in the CDC guidelines, until recently amended, they were then supposed to be handed off to a medication-assisted treatment program or given an appointment at one, um, and nowhere in that um, whole scenario was there a formal psychiatric evaluation, a formal evaluation for suicidality, uh, or even seeing a mental health professional. So we came into this and said, okay, this is 2017. Okay, how many people... Um, with opioid use disorder just have a history of major depression. And if you look at the data, it's at least 50%. It's like mm. not uncommon. It's like great. It, it's, it's really common. And people with opioid use disorders, according to Nora Volkov, the director at NIDA, are mm -hmm. 13 times greater chance of attempting and completing suicide than the general population. So putting those things together, we said, okay, naloxone's been great at saving lives, but still people continue to overdose. Many people overdose many times, and the prevalence of overdose is increasing. So we might like to think that there's, there are some subpopulations within the population that overdose, and the comorbid major depression, the anhedonic depressed person who needs, in addition to opioid use disorder treatment, psychiatric treatment for depression, is um, not being identified, not being triaged out, and not being treated. And that's really what we said in um, as early as 2017. That, you know, I find it really interesting, and I wanted to uh, just touch base on what you said in regards to the naloxone. Um, I want to say that there was actually a recent um, study that, uh, not study, but that came out or actually a report from the CDC. Correct me if I'm wrong. I, I do believe actually that now in terms of the guidelines, whenever a patient has, if you will, a high dose opiate prescription, they should be also given a naloxone um, prescription. But my reading of it, and I want to say this was actually in our opiate resource center, um, was that Roughly one out of every 69 of those patients is actually given naloxone. And why do I bring this up? Um, it goes back to what you said in, about actually finding out what happened. A person who, 
who we reverse the uh, side of the overdose uh, effects of opiates with the addition of naloxone, we could actually get a history from that person and figure exactly. out exactly what happened. So I thought that that was really, really, really a very important point that there's so much, if you will, in terms of the how a patient got to the point and whether that overdose attempt was actually um, intentional or an accident, if you will, I would argue that I think many would, based off of what you said in terms of the chronic brain changes, I would say it certainly, we could argue particularly that it is, if you will, just a slow form of, you know, continuing use disorder of suicide. But the, also the thing that you talked about in terms of brain change um, as that subpopulation that we are missing that has major depressive disorder, that has an anhedonic uh, depression, and what are we actually doing to triage, pre prevent, as well as treat those patients? The other thing, even though it's not a topic for this podcast, what it also makes me think about is the brain changes that chronic opioid use or other substance uses cause and whether or not what the association of those are with this concept that others on the psych have talked about, suicide-specific um, crisis syndrome. I'm thinking about mm -hmm. Dr. Gallinker. So I, mm -hmm. I think it's very, what you said, Dr. Gold, in terms of, again, the we, we focus on the behavior a lot, but also the chronic changes in the brain that chronic, if you will, opioid use or use of substance use disorders can cause. So I found that extremely Extremely, extremely, extremely uh, <laughs> huge points. Um, thank, now, thank you. Thank you. Now, I wanted to hear a little bit more about um, your views on, because recently, um, if you will, we've had major, um, if you will, um, um, if you will, individuals um, come out and say that linking suicide all right, formally, or making suicide a formal part of the opiate epi epidemic. And I was wondering if you could maybe comment a little bit on that and kind of what your views are with that. Sure. So um, once we get past the idea that all overdoses are accidental, we can start to interrogate the data, see what we have, and then try to get new data. So just looking at old data, like I said uh before, there's a high degree of comorbidity among people with opioid use disorder and major depression. We also know that um, one emergency department comes to mind. The, uh, there's an emergency department in Flint, Michigan, that actually um, looked at people who were um, rescued, who had past um, opioid overdoses, and ask them uh, um, if they were uh, thinking about suicide. And if you include everything, like um, I wouldn't care if I woke up or people would be better off without me or I thought there was a chance that I could die and kind of so what, their, um, their data said over 30% of the overdoses would cause would fall into that category, meaning that if they were not an overdose and just showed up at the emergency department, they would have been sent to a psychiatric hospital mm. or, or a psychiatrist for an evaluation because they were acutely suicidal or they might have had a, a plan. Very few of the people actually said in that setting that they didn't know what their intentions were and it was kind of a, a complete accident. So I say at the least, the, the National Institute of Drug Abuse Director and the NIMH Director in their September uh, blog, a co-director blog, said that about 30% of all opioid overdoses might fit into the description of opioids as the method of mm -hmm. suicide, right? So that's kind of where you were coming from. Mm -hmm. was, there, you suicide's a big thing, and it's not just I definitely want to die this time. And, and, you know, and there's a lot to be learned from rescuing patients. I don't know yes. about your work, but you know, for me, I remember rescuing people with naloxone, and I remember um, cardioversion. I remember doing a Heimlich maneuver. I remember um, other kinds of 
of resuscitation. And the thing that strikes you is, is that the opioid um, reversals with naloxone, the patients are often angry that you saved their life. Really? I really that I have not yeah. I have not been involved in that level of if you will direct reversal uh where but it's an interesting thing to think it's about. a very interesting thing it's a very interesting thing yeah very I mean, interesting like you, yeah and it's one of the reasons in the early days that it was very hard to to uh to get you know Yale psychiatrists to work in the emergency department with us or in the store ha- storefront clinics in the in this community the patients were could be angry at you and one of the i don't know what sticks in my mind you know how you were telling a story about one of your patients one of my patients you know you you see somebody with shallow to very um slow respiration pinpoint mm-hmm. pupils um sweating and a, a really thread-like pulse and you give them narcan and they wake up and they say, why did you do that? I was just sleeping. Or why did you do that? You ruined my high. Or you just should have left me alone. You don't often hear, thanks for saving my life. You do hear it, but um, well, not you know like what? you do. Mm-hmm. Well, here's, uh, here would be the follow-up question I'd have to that, Dr. Gold. Immediately... In a certain way, I can absolutely see that in regards to, if you will, defenses of denial, a number of things. But well, I'd be very curious, depending on the patient's path, um, two yeah. months, three months, six months out, what yeah. they think yeah. about. Yeah. Do they actually yeah. still have the yeah. same stance in regards yeah. to it? Because even though it's not overdose, when I have yeah. had the honor and privilege of working with my patients, and they've been rather close to suicide. And let's, many of the, our listeners have been in situations where they've had to involuntarily hospitalize somebody and dealt with the anger and extreme anger at uh, the prospect of being involuntary hospitalization. It has been my experience, though. Uh, I, I don't have percentages because I'm not going to do a chart review um, at the moment. But I'd say the I majority, do. and by that, over 50% do later come back and say, you know what? I appreciate that we got to work together and that this outcome occurred. So that's kind of what I think about when you, with that story. Yeah, I mean, I say, you know, for in addiction, you have is complicated, like everything, and it's yes. complicated in the ways that um, addiction experts talk to each other. Some mm-hmm. people would say that because the brain is in an opioid state, giving antagonist causes irritability and aggression, and mm-hmm. it's really just the antagonist working. Other people might say that um, the patient um, is right and that they didn't need naloxone, that, they, that they've done this a number of other times and every time woke up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and and they, they, they spent a, a certain amount of money and had certain expectations. And um, when they passed out, their friends called 911. Um, I think there probably is a range of experiences, but I I did um, think it's worth discussing because I I think that the, many of the people who are rescued would like to have a psychiatric evaluation or an evaluation of their thinking and behavior and would like to know if they had an important co-occurring psychiatric disorder. And let me follow up with that because, Dr. Gold, you've really um, given us, if you will, an idea of like where were we? Where were we at? We were uh, there were the ways in which we fought about overdose in the past decades, uh, a combination of actual intentional versus an accident. The the thought process about that has changed. Um, in addition to where we were at in the past, psychiatrists, mental health uh, professionals were not actually really embedded or part of that, if you will, um, someone post-overdose necessarily, them getting a psychiatric evaluation right. for um, us to look at, if you will, comorbid conditions. I actually really think that another way to look at it is to really assess for not if, how chronic use has changed uh, this patient's at the function of their brain. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, that's, I think that would probably be the better default to say not if it's changed, how, and what we are yep. doing um, about it. So 
now really with your work and work of others really questioning this in regards to, you know, how, opiate overdoses, why don't we start to really start to look at that as um, an actual suicide attempt? And what does the data, limited as it may be at times, tell us? With that kind of as a historical framework or a background, what do you see in terms of the future as there is in terms of dealing with um, over, we can talk overdoses in general, opiate overdoses uh, specifically, um, but what do you see as the future? Um, because right now we have a number of folks, um, I want to say that there's been uh, $1.8 billion um, in new funding for the mm -hmm. opiate crisis. Yep. I want to say $900 million of it. Um, there was it $932 million of it coming from the Substance Abuse Mental Health and Services. Right. And then, gosh, I'm blanking on where that – I want to say $900 million of it also came from, I want to say maybe the C CDC going uh, to all uh, the different states. So I may be uh, misquoting, like, the sources, but overall it's about $1.8 billion. So people are actually putting – Money, we're starting to see money being put into the opiate uh, epidemic. But please give us an idea of, if you will, the future and how you see it. Well, you know, um, I, as a translational uh, researcher and scientist, the, um, what we don't know is really striking. So here we have um, these overdoses, and we do have Narcan. It's a wonder drug, and mm -hmm. that is great. But if you went down the list and said, what about the other half of the overdoses, which mm -hmm. would be um, cocaine and methamphetamine? Mm -hmm. And some of those have adulterated fentanyl in it, but mm -hmm. the majority don't. Well, so what treatments do we have for psychostimulants? I, I worked for many years on both of those. We have no treatments. So there's no mm -hmm. FDA-approved medication. There may be medication-assisted treatment for opioid use disorder, and we'd like to make it better because there's a high relapse rate and there's all kinds of adherence problems. We, but we do at least have something. We don't have anything for uh, stimulants. We have nothing for cannabis use disorders that's approved. And even when you come right down to it, um, uh, we don't understand the different subtypes. And this we've been talking around this of – people that have opioid use disorder. There'll be mm -hmm. some of them that have concurrent anxiety disorders or panic attacks or, or um, major depressive disorders mm -hmm. or genetic vulnerabilities or pharmacokinetic differences in how they metabolize the drugs. All this, like how long should somebody be on a medication-assisted treatment? When is a person, when, when has their brain reset? Are there some medications that are better for craving or provoke craving um, than others. You know, mm -hmm. in that regard, injectable naltrexone and naltrexone looks particularly promising in, in that area. The use of brain imaging. So I think you're going to see in the mm. future um, the use of, of imaging to look at the effects of drugs, the changes that drugs have caused on that particular person's brain, and then their brain over time. You'll see genetics coming in because there's a lot of genetic polymorphism in both the dopamine and opioid system that could be risk, very important risk factors and very important targets for um, uh, treatment. Just think about what happens if a person has a genetic abnormality mm -hmm like we call it the OPRM1 polymorphism in mm -hmm. the opioid system that might make them much more likely to be addicted on a first dose or, uh, mm -hmm. or a few doses and then much more resistant to recovery. Um, we're going to learn a lot more from the studies of younger people about drug initiation. It may be mm -hmm. that early use of cannabis, early use of tobacco, early use of alcohol sensitizes the brain in a way that makes opioid and cocaine and methamphetamine um, abuse and dependence um, more uh, difficult um, to treat. So I do think we'll see molecular imaging, genetics, and we'll see that applied principally to opioid system, dopamine system, and maybe even cannabinoid system, which is involved in all three. They're kind of, you know, involved with each other. 
But I, I, I think you, the, the money will help us understand how these substance use disorders are different and give us the opportunity really for the first time to consider individualizing treatment where right now, you know, if you fail at mm-hmm. treatment, you're in a you're in a suboxone program. You fail at right. treatment, they put you you know you put back in the same program. You might be right. in that program seven times, but right. we we never do that in depression. So, um, mm-hmm. but we don't we don't know enough to be able to decide which treatment is best for which person at which time and at which age. Okay. You, you know, Dr. Gold, you brought up, um, we talked about, if you will, imaging, genetics. Um, mm-hmm. This is, I'm, I'm going to, I'm asking maybe a little bit of a, out, a, a tough question, um, and I just mm-hmm. want to get your thoughts on it. We have the DSM-5 criteria, all right, for substance mm-hmm. use disorders. Do you, this is, give me a little rope with this. Do you think we're at <laughs> a point, do you think we're at a point yet um, where we could actually use data, if you will, genetics, imaging, a variety of things to not replace the DSM-5, so I don't want everyone to start screaming, but to perhaps supplement it or give us some additional tools to work with? Are we there yet? No, we're not there yet, but it's, it's where we'd, you'd like to be. I mean, if you think about it, mm-hmm. in um, in medicine, you can have a sore throat or you can right. have a strep throat. I mean, yeah, <laughs> just having having a strep throat informs what the treatment is. I mm-hmm. used to have a teacher a teacher at, at Yale, um, Bob Bick, who used to say, "I don't really care if the person diagnosis is bipolar. I'd like to know if they have a lithium responsive mood disorder." Absolutely, absolutely. That so I've... I do really, you know, that's kind of the bottom line. Would you really like a diagnosis that that is it enables personalization of treatment and targeting mm-hmm. of treatment so it's maximally effective. Okay. I have, well, thank I'm with you. That. Yeah, that is that's that is going to give us uh, – just even just thinking about that, I really think that that's really where we want to go, and hopefully slowly but surely we're getting there. Now, I wanted to just – Get your take or your views on. Let's just say that the next year we've we've got we people are pushing out funding. All right, mm-hmm. um, we have the we have the Health and Human Services five point strategy, um, including access to better prevention, better data on the epidemic, better pain management, um, drugs in terms of combating or reversing overdose, as well as research. So we they have a five point strategy. And for those who haven't looked at it, I think it can be a useful thing to look at. I go back to what Dr. Gold said, though. I mean, scrutinize it for like how much you see the word suicide or psychiatrist or mental health professional in it, um, I mean, which it don't, it's in there. But I think listen to this podcast and then go back to the, the uh, five-point health and human services strategy and maybe think about, um, you know, what that actually means at a local level where you're practicing. But, Dr. Gold, over the next year, next year, what, what do you see out there? What, what do you see? What do you think will happen? And maybe what would you like to see in terms of uh, the opiate epidemic and overdoses? Thanks. So I think for the opioid epidemic, there is like a CDC update that says if a person is given naloxone and reversed, that we yep. should get a behavioral and psychiatric history. That's great. That, yep. that is one. You added a second one, which is for people giving, given high doses of opioids for pain, people given, and I think they usually use like 50 uh, mm-hmm. morphine equivalents, people given... Um, uh, opioids plus benzodiazepines, people in who are substance use disordered and using opioids, that there's a movement to uh, give them uh, naloxone to mm-hmm. carry in case they do overdose accidentally so that somebody around them can reverse it. I don't remember how many states have passed enabling legislation but I do know that a state like Vermont has the most um, co-prescribing because of some legislation. And other mm-hmm. states where it's just totally um, left up in the air see very few people um, with naloxone. So if you do believe the Allison Pitts work at Stanford, 
that the most important thing we can do in the opioid crisis is to reverse overdoses and keep people alive so that treatment can actually help them, um, then you need to have naloxone because you can't do, uh, you know, you can do a Heimlich and you can do CPR, but you can't reverse an opioid overdose without naloxone. I think the pharmaceutical industry is going to be working to help um, provide us with some Mm -hmm. longer-acting treatments, like right now, um, uh, one of the companies makes injectable naltrexone. There have been trials at implants, and there are trials at longer-acting. Both of those would be really beneficial. I think NIDA has has, um, really stepped up and done an amazing job at identifying some novel things that can be done. And I think it's because the director as a psychiatrist thinks like this to Mm -hmm. rejuvenate the brain's pleasure system and the brain's dopamine system. So in 1984 and 85, my group um, suggested, and it's called the dopamine hypothesis, that Mm -hmm. cocaine users, rather than increasing the amount of dopamine released after each use, get less and less and less, and so that the net for addiction is a hypo-dopaminergic state, an anhedonic state. And even though they're using drugs continuously, they just can't get any pleasure out of it. So if that's the case, you might say, why don't we target uh, regenerative medicine through Mm -hmm. recovery? Like like, um, in animal studies, the brain reward threshold, the amount of electricity that the brain needs to get pleasure is raised by drug exposure. And so the question that we've raised is how can the brain recover? How can an addict return to pre-morbid function? Not just stable function, not just coming to a program uh, or being alive, some outcome measures of health and wellness, we should add to that what they were like before or what optimal brain function might be. Well, NIDA has started to fund things like vigorous physical exercise in dopamine recovery, transcranial magnetic stimulation Mm -hmm. and dopamine recovery, all sorts of approaches targeting like the what's next. What's next should be um, returning the person to the way they were beforehand. Well, well said, Dr. Go. What's next should be returning the person to the way they were beforehand. Um, I wanted to, you mentioned so many really, really, really important points and kind of what it is that we should look for uh, in the year ahead. And one thing I wanted to, uh, well, a couple of things I wanted to touch base on, um, it, kind of linking some things that you said, uh, along with recent things that have come out. Um, we need to, we need to, think strongly about how we screen and prevent opiate use disorders from the start. Um, I want to say that the U.S. Preventive Service and Task Force, they recently came out and they recommended for the first time that um, primary care clinicians, our colleagues in primary care, start screening adults age 18 or older for illicit drug use. It's a grade B recommendation, but it's a start. Um, mm-hmm. I think that when you when you start to screen, then we, we've started the idea and in, in, thinking about mental health early on, but hopefully before we've ever gotten to the point of an opiate use disorder. The next thing is what you talked about in regards to the naloxone. Um, Again, another way to think about this, I want to say this was also a study that came out of, uh, I want to say the CDC after a a recent morbidity and mortality weekly report, approximately like 9 million more naloxone prescriptions could have been dispensed. I mean, when you think about the number of that, like 9 million more, I mean, this isn't Mm -hmm. research. This isn't uh, a new grant. This isn't a new genetic imaging. This isn't a new biomarker or MRI technique. We just need to, I mean, there was this old thing I remember an attending used to tell me, like, if you prescribe an opiate in one hand, you prescribe a laxative in the other hand. I'll say it again. If you prescribe an opiate with your right hand, you prescribe a laxative with the other hand. If we are prescribing high-dose opiates and benzos, if we can just get it in our head that 
we should be prescribing naloxone with that, almost like buckling your seatbelt. Um, if they start, it's most certainly not the solution. Um, but it's, it's started. It could be a part of something. And then once you do that, once you get people, if you can save more people, as many people would argue, then you can get folks to people like Dr. Gold and other specialists who are thinking about new and innovative ways to not just, you know, rehab, but actually regenerate the brain, to actually get the person back to where they were and hopefully we would aspire to better. The technology, um, the techniques are just not quite there yet, but we have to start um, someplace. And I think, Dr. Go, what you've been talking about in regards to how we think about um, overdoses and opiate overdoses uh, specifically um, and really linking it in a very – formal, specific way with suicide and how we critically think about how we can best serve uh, the patients we're honored to treat, you know, who are dealing with substance use disorders and treat all the various populations that are contained in an overdose cohort. I, I really I want to thank you for what you shared with us. But those are some of the things that I thought that you triggered in me, and I really hope that um, – our um, audience listens to this podcast. I really hope that they, if you are, regardless of whatever field that you're in, there's a lot of flexible funding out there. Uh, I want to say $932 million. That can be used in a variety of ways. Um, I want people to listen to what Dr. Gold said. Um, also, if you're wondering about any of the data that I was pulling, just go visit our Opiate Resource Center, or for that matter, I mean, I'm sure if you go to Dr. Gold's uh, website or blog, you'll probably find a ton of stuff. So with that being said, uh, Dr. Gold, I want to leave the final words for you, sir. Well, you did a great summary, and um, it's a pleasure to be on this with you. Uh, your perspective is very, very important, and everything that you had to say that summarized what I said, Dr. Norris, um, makes me sound very literate. So uh, you can so please feel free to summarize what I said anytime because you did a much better job than I would have done. Um, I'm obsessed with dopamine function, as uh, many of the, your listeners know, and so rehabbing that is probably my message, but your message on naloxone is one that's going to save lives tomorrow. Bravo. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Gold, and I thank you for everything that you have uh, contributed. I do want to close with one thing because um, you, what you said I think is um, – Somewhat, you, you you think very. You're a visionary. You think about things ahead of time. And one of my attendings, Dr. Glazerman at Mount Sinai, this was when I think Seroquel was just kind of new, quetiapine rather. And she she told me everything about the metabolic syndrome, essentially when it was in its infancy, right before it happened, before any of the screening, before any of the stuff that we had. She said what was going to happen, and I was like, whoa. I hope the audience listened to you because I think you, not I think I know, you identified a very, I think, potentially the next crisis, if we're not careful, and that's the use of stimulant medication. Um, there's an increasing use of stimulant medication. I think similar to how you sounded the, uh, the alarm in regards to opiate overdoses um, being, if you will, linked to suicide. And I would challenge many of my, everybody who's listening to this podcast, I want you to think about how much stimulant medication you are now prescribing and whether or not 5 to 10 to 15 years down the road we are going to be facing another crisis, whether it's due to uh, overprescription of stimulants for attention deficit disorder or name your pick. But I think that that, is, that was really a great insight on your part that I wanted to highlight for the listeners because I, when you said that, I was like, whoa. That could be the next thing, if it isn't already, but it most certainly could be. Dr. Gold, I want to thank you for appearing on the Sidecast. Uh, look forward to having you again, and um, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. My pleasure. And that concludes this week's edition of the Sidecast by MD Edge. It's time for the credits. The MDH Sidecast is hosted by the Editor-in-Chief of MDH Psychiatry, Dr. Lorenzo Norris. The show notes are authored by Dr. Jacqueline Posada. MDH Sidecast audio producers are Gina Henderson and Jeff Bauer. All of MDH podcasts are produced by executive editors Denise Fulton and Kathy Scarbeck, as well as MDH multimedia editor Terry Rudd. The social media for Sidecast and all of MDH podcasts is produced by Kyla Clark. I am the audio engineer, audio editor, and the voice of MDH podcast, Nick Andrews. Thanks for joining us this week on the Sitecast by MD Edge.